Repetition compulsion is the phenomenon where survivors of trauma re-expose themselves to situations reminiscent of the original trauma, often compulsively and without realizing consciously why they're doing so. This phenomenon has been described in the literature since the late 19th century by thinkers such as Janet and Freud, but wasn't really systematically explored until Bessel van der Kolk wrote his 1989 paper, The Compulsion to Repeat the Trauma. Some examples of repetition compulsion include Vietnam veterans who compulsively watch Vietnam War movies over and over again, even if such movies trigger them or make them upset later. Survivors of physical abuse as children may often get into fights repeatedly as adults. Survivors of sexual abuse as children may engage in risky sexual behaviors as adults or even engage in sex work if destitute. First responders such as EMTs are also statistically more likely to have had a history of trauma than the general population. Repetition compulsion often involves harm to others. Perpetrators of violent crimes often were victims of violence as children. Bessel van der Kolk also argues that Revictimization can partially be thought to be due to repetition compulsion. Revictimization is a statistical phenomenon where survivors of sexual violence, for instance, are more likely to be revictimized again, or other survivors of violence, such as robbery, are also more likely to be revictimized again, more than the general population. According to Van der Kolk, in the reenactment of the trauma, in the behavioral reenactment of the trauma, the survivor of the trauma either reenacts the role of victim or victimizer. In this framework, however, Bessel van der Kolk doesn't really address two ideas adequately. The first is that he proposes that victims are, or victims in the reenactment are more likely to be women and victimizers in the reenactment are more likely to be men. However, this is not really uh, consistent with uh, modern ideas about gender and, for example, doesn't really address like violence in queer relationships. Secondly, Bessel van der Kolk doesn't really address the idea of trauma as a diathesis spreading from person to person, mutating, changing, evolving. He really focuses more on the individual level, or that is, the idea of individual reenactment rather than the idea of reenactment spreading from person to person. He also would like to put this theory forward, the idea of traumatic infection. Trauma is a virus that spreads from person to person. It can change, it can mutate, and it causes people to reenact trauma, spreading trauma further. There are two ways in trauma can spread. Firstly, they can reenact the trauma on others, or they can reenact it on themselves. Both actually allow trauma to spread in different ways, similarly to the viral lysogenic cycle. In frustration-aggression theory, frustration is thought to be the source of aggression. However, I would like to modify this for trauma. So, in the original framework, frustration can sometimes cause other responses other than aggression, for example, withdrawal. So it is well known that trauma can sort of produce paradoxical effects, right? It can produce uh, avoidant effects, right, or counter-avoidant effects where people return to the trauma, right? So, um, in, place of a, in place of aggression, what might have, one might have withdrawal responses in response to trauma. Um, one such example might be uh, domestic violence survivors um, feeling emotions that they felt as a child in violent homes and therefore being afraid to leave. They withdraw from the situation, they become passive. If trauma results in aggression, 
it can either lead to inward aggression against the self or outward aggression against others. An inward aggression, this might take the form of self-harm, self-destructive behavior, self-mutilation. An outward aggression, in contrast to frustration ag aggression theory, where, where one could see both direct aggression and displaced aggression, and direct aggression is against the original source of the frustration in frustration aggression theory, um, one can't really uh, direct their aggression towards the original source of the aggression because trauma happened in the past and the trauma is usually over and therefore only displaced aggression is possible. In frustration aggression theory, displaced aggression happens because it is not appropriate for the person uh, who has a frustration to direct their aggression at the source of the frustration. For example, their boss. Their boss has too much power over them. So instead, for example, in the, uh, in the classic example, uh, the uh, worker directs his aggression or displaces his aggression at his wife. And then the wife then displaces aggression towards the dog. And the dog then displaces their his aggression towards the mailman, and the mailman then, then displaces his aggression towards his wife because of the trauma he experienced from his do uh, from uh, one of the uh, customer's dogs. So, if we were to reformulate this for trauma, um, it is no longer possible to direct aggression against the original source of the trauma, not because of power reasons, but because it's just no longer physically and like temporally possible. So instead, trauma is displaced from person to person, just as it did in the original frustration aggression framework. However, in my theory, traumatic infection theory, trauma is not merely an upgraded form of frustration. Trauma has its own unique payload that can change the person that receives it. Furthermore, unlike mere frustration, trauma tends to be encoded as state-dependent memory, a type of memory that's best retrieved in physiological states uh, similar to the state when the memory was encoded. State-dependent memory makes it more possible or likely for trauma to be directed against the self or against others that is displaced because in everyday situations involving interpersonal relationships might trigger emotions that are then projected or displaced onto the people that triggered those strong feelings brought up by those memories. In some cases, those emotions are displaced onto the self. Finally, trauma as a virus takes advantage of This can be seen in the learned helplessness experiments involving dogs in the 1970s. It's a bit unethical today, but in these experiments, dogs were put in cages that were either opened or closed and then shocked in the cages. And the, the dogs that are in the cages that are open left immediately, they ran out. But those who were in the cages learned to be helpless, they learned to whimper. So even when the cages were open and they were shocked again, they didn't leave. They didn't realize it was possible to leave. To be in the cage was familiar, and even though it was painful, was preferable to this unknown world of leaving when in this stressed, shocked state. This connects the mere exposure effect to trauma. That is, Survivors of trauma will begin to like situations simply because they've been exposed to it more. And by like, I mean they might, it seems they choose decisions that show preference for such situations. Um, and this might lead to the quote unquote passive mothers and abusive father dynamic, uh, which is sort of inaccurate, uh, but reflects this idea where mothers can allow trauma to propagate because. Um, by choosing to reenact the victim role, they allow their children to get victimized, continuing the cycle. 
Now, this must be modified for our current understanding, current contemporary understanding of gender, but this is how trauma can spread in stages. So in the viral lysogenic cycle, right, viruses can either spread, they infect cells, burst, and aggressively go from cell to cell, or they can hide in cells encoded in the genome of that cell and wait until the time is ripe to burst out again. Um, this is so trauma can infect others ag- uh, actively or hide itself in latent generations, uh, perhaps uh, in individuals reenacting the victim role, ready to begin the cycle when um, uh, when it is opportunistic. One compelling reason to modify the stereotypical gender dynamics of traumatic reenactment as proposed by Bessel van der Kolk and also to view it from an evolutionary perspective is is to consider that many women abusers of male children are systematically underdetected by the system. Thus, their form of trauma propagation is selected for because it is least detected by society, so it spreads the most successfully, and by successfully I mean, I mean like in a reproductive evolutionary way. And furthermore, this alters the transmission dynamics, so instead of the helpless mother and the aggressive father, it be- the dynamic changes to one where the aggressive, some of the aggressor stages include women.